The following program is an original MCM production for Community Channel 14. January has been declared Human Trafficking Awareness and Prevention Month by President Obama. This is a little bit about what the President said. When a man, desperate for work, finds himself in a factory, or on a fishing boat, or in a field, working, toiling for little or no pay, and beaten if he tries to escape, that's slavery. When a woman is locked in a sweatshop, or trapped in a home as a domestic servant, alone and abused and incapable of leaving, that's slavery. When a little boy is kidnapped, turned into a child soldier, forced to kill or be killed, that's slavery. When a little girl is sold by her impoverished family, girls my own daughter's age, runs away from home or is lured by false promises of a better life and then imprisoned in a brothel and tortured if she resists. That's slavery. How appropriate that we are meeting here on the last day of January, Human Trafficking Awareness Month. I first learned about human trafficking and the League of Women Voters connection or involvement three years ago at our national convention in Washington, DC. League members from across the country attempted to make it a national study. Remember, that in the League of Women Voters, we study, we reach member agreement or consensus, and then we adopt a position before we can take action. The League can only take action on legislation that we have a position on. I know that sometimes that's kind of frustrating to some of our members, but that's the way the League was established. Our public policy positions were not sufficient to allow the League to act comprehensively on the issue of human trafficking. It didn't pass as a national study in 2012, so the leaders in Texas and in New Jersey launched their own state studies. And we do have good information from them. It's been mentioned in our bulletin, and it will be available on our website. New Jersey adopted a position on human trafficking in 2013. And at national convention last June, June 2014, the delegates voted to concur or agree with the New Jersey position. And what that means is that we don't have to do a full-blown national study. So we have a great panel today. And thank you all for coming. Uh, we're going to start with Kareen Marino Taxman, and she is an assistant U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of Wisconsin, where she presently handles complex com uh, criminal investigations and prosecutions. Uh, she has dedicated her professional career to being a voice in the courts for victims of crime. Ms. Marino Taxman brings this to uh, this morning her experience working for the Department of Justice in conjunction with the State Department. And from 2007 to 2009, she was in Brazil. And from 2009 to 2011, she was in Mexico, working on international issues. In addition to that, since her return here to the Eastern District of Wisconsin, she has prosecuted several domestic commercial sex trafficking cases, and she's worked with the victims of these crimes. I welcome Ms. Kareen Marino Taxman. Hey, good. Good morning. good morning. I have to tell you that I was so thrilled to be asked to come here um, because uh, as I was talking to your former president, when you think about human trafficking and the League of Women Voters, what is more impeding for a person's right to vote to be a slave, right? I mean, so if you are really, and your mission is to get people be, to be able to vote and to take care of part of the legal process, and when someone is enslaved, 
they can't vote. They can't, they, can't, they have no voice. And so, and that's what you've dedicated yourselves to in your work, and that's what I try to dedicate myself in my work. And I'm really honored to be here. And just to see, very happy to see that I know some of you, because it means that we have some kindred spirits here, but also very happy to be here and meet new people so that we can partner. Um, I have to give the disclaimer that these are my views and not the views of the Department of Justice. I'm really not going to give you many opinions anyway. I'm mostly going to be talking about uh, what human trafficking is, but just so that I have myself covered. Um, I really like this picture um, because, I mean, I don't like it in the sense that it's a horrible picture, but it really tells a lot of the story of what human trafficking is. And you can see a child, look at those shoes, so feet of a child in those big stiletto shoes on a dark and lonely street. And mostly because it's also domestic. We all want to think that human trafficking is in other countries, third world countries. And what I'm really going to focus today on is human trafficking in our neighborhoods, in our communities, and in the United States. Um, People often say that human trafficking is a form of slavery, and I've come to believe, so there's an opinion, that it's not um, a form of slavery, but it is slavery. And I think by the end of this presentation, hopefully you will see that what human trafficking is, is very similar to those invisible fences that dogs get put with. You know how the dog knows they can't leave, right? People looking from the outside, though, can't see the fence. And so it looks like the dog is roaming free, has the ability to go wherever that dog wants. But in reality, trying to get near that fence, first of all, they probably get hit by their master and told not to do it. And then if they do go near that fence, they get electric shock. And I think that that is as I've been thinking about this more and more, the image I want you to think about when you think about domestic human trafficking in the United States and why you might not have seen it, because you're seeing a, the equivalent, I don't want to say of a dog because I feel horrible saying that, but the equivalent of a person who appears to be free and in fact has that invisible fence every minute in their lives. Um, we used to talk about the three-legged stool. And if you look at your new uh, position policy, um, you are ahead of most because um, you have actually incorporated all four levels. Um, we used to talk about prevention, you know, training, having people know what's going on, protection, providing systems to protect our victims, and then put prosecution, putting the worst perpetrators in um, custody. Uh, but really, one of the things that we have realized is none of that works unless we turn that stool into a chair and that is partnership. There is no way that I can lock up every pimp in Milwaukee in the Eastern District of Wisconsin and solve the problem. There is no way I can get every international trafficker or labor trafficker and solve the problem. We have to work together. So how important is the private sector? Because I want to make sure you understand that uh, as much as I've dedicated uh, many, many days working on this, without you, um, we cannot eliminate human trafficking. Uh, people are, the community, people, citizens working together, that is a crucial part. You have the resources, the capacity, and the outreach that I can never get because I'm working at a job, you are out in the community and seeing, and so you bring skills that are very necessary in combating human trafficking. You're the ones who can do things like the league has done, bring out, have a policy statement, start doing training, start talking to people. And so without you, I do not believe that we can affect and reduce the amount of human trafficking. So what is sex trafficking? Now, before I talk about, um, it's when people, the three words you need to know, and if you want to write them down, this is probably the three most important words. It's force, fraud, or coercion. Force, fraud, and coercion. Um, that is the ways that human trafficking is done. It's either done through force, fraud, or coercion. And it's, I'm going to be talking today about the commercial sex trade. I'm not going to be talking about labor 
or other areas, and I'm not going to be talking about international human trafficking, I'm just going to be focusing on what we have in our communities. Um, any child who is involved in the commercial sex trade, whether or not there, there is force, fraud, or coercion, is a victim of human trafficking, and a child is defined as someone who's under 18 years of age. The victims are usually vulnerable, and that is probably the, the hardest part about combating this crime is because the victims are people that we miss, the ones we don't see, the ones who no one paid attention to. I can remember talking to a victim who said that when she ran away, no one looked for her. So how do you help that victim? She said, I wished somebody put out an Amber Alert. I wish someone had made a missing person's report on me, but no one did. I ran away and it was like every, nothing had changed. So they use force, fraud, and coercion. Those are their tools of how to get human traffickers how to get victims. Um, in the United States, human trafficking, commercial human trafficking starts as young as the age of 13. Now, um, people say, well, it's trafficking. Where's the traffic part? You know, don't you need to travel from one place to the next? The word trafficking, really, I would like you to think of it the same way you think of drug trafficking or gun trafficking. It is being in the business of selling, so you're in the business of selling drugs, you're in the business of selling guns, you're in the business of selling humans. So that's why it's called trafficking. There's no need to move or to transport. Those, some cases are based on that, people being transported and moved, but the law does not require that. It's the business of selling humans. So is it really happening? Um, I love this slide as well because nobody wants to see it. You know, it's not just that we don't see it, but we don't want to see it, and we help each other see. And part of the crime in the commercial sex trade is that the victims have to act like they're loving it. Right? You can't have a victim have, uh, go on a date and cry and show her wounds and talk to her fear to the John who is paying for her services. She has to convince that John that he is the very best she's ever met. Right? So she's going to be happy and beautiful and wonderful and act like there's never been another lover like him before. Now, now you would think that he would kind of wonder, you know, if it wasn't for the money, would I be this good? <laughs> and it is all about the built money. $32 billion. Now, I think that's a wrong number. I think it's a lot, lot more. You know, you have these studies that come out and someone gives a number of $32 billion, and everybody looks at it and they say, well, $32 billion, it's got to be at least that. So let's all stick to that because it's safe. And so I would say that $32 billion is really, really a very low number of what, how much the industry. It is the third largest source of income for criminal groups. Okay, what are the first two? Who can, anybody have any ideas? Yeah. Drugs, number one, drugs. Number two? Guns. guns, there you go. Okay, so guns, drugs first, then guns, and human trafficking is moving up right away. And part of the, so, and who are the traffickers? Let's talk about who they are. So 52% of those who recruit the victims are men, but 42% are women and 6% are both men and women. So there is, it's not just a man's game. In 40%, 54% of the cases, the, the, the recruiter was a stranger. So that's, we would expect that to be strangers who find these victims. But in 46%, the victim knew the perpetrator. So it's a crime where it's an easy money maker. And why is that? If you're selling cocaine, you have to get a kilo of cocaine and sell it. And then when you need your next kilo of cocaine, you have to go find it and sell it. Same with guns. You have a gun, you get it, sell it, keep going. With human beings, you can keep reusing them and reusing them and reusing them. You don't have to get a new one. And so um, studies show that approximately $200,000 is what a pimp can make off of one woman or girl in a year. 
So what does it look like in the United States? Well, you know, we've seen the pimp mobiles. We wish that all the pimps drove these kind of cars so we could identify them, but uh, they don't. But uh, some do. Um, we've seen a lot of father and son teams. It's something that is from generation to generation, is passed on. And um, these are two individuals in New York, father and son, who were tried together. And uh, basically, they talked about, um, throughout the investigation, about how the most important thing was controlling the victims. Human traffickers view the women and children that they traffic as their chattel. They actually call it a, their stable. And they brand them. And they brand them in places where you might not necessarily know to look or understand where it is. But if you think about why would somebody have someone's name put into their mouth or on their back of their neck or um, on very often on their buttocks, um, it's because the human traffickers want the victims to know that they own them. They are like we brand cattle. Um, this is one of the letters that was recovered in a search warrant. And um, I've sort of tried to type it out so you could read it a little bit better. Uh, clearly, this guy does not have the best spelling or um, education. But uh, if you read through this, mostly what he's talking about is the control and making sure that the victims don't know that they can leave and keeping them off their, off their center and making sure that you punish them if they do anything that is contrary to the rules. And he says, give respect and respect's due. Follow these rules and you should be Gucci, which I think means that you'll do well, right? Gucci, expensive clothing. And they call it the rules of the game of hoes. So profit requires structure, right? Every business model has that. And um, they're organized, uh, human trafficking is organized into a business model where um, there is a guy on the top, which is the, the pimp. Underneath him is often someone who we call the bottom girl or the bottom bitch. And that's where, when I gave you statistics of showing the women involved, many of the way they're involved is in being the bottom girl. And that is someone who has moved up in the ranks and now helps in recruiting, enforcing punishment, and in keeping the other girls and women in line. And then there's all the other victims. Um, and basically, she's the one who's been around the longest. One of the ways that uh, human trafficking succeeds in the United States is because the pimps control the victims in many, many ways. They take their identification, they give them false IDs. If they're under 18, they will give them the ID of someone who is 21 so they can get into strip clubs or go on, uh, into bars or go into casinos. They'll then take their ID, and when we do search warrants, we'll often find identifications of children um, in the pimp's residence. They also take the girls and women out of their comfort zone. We call it doing the circuit. And that means that a Milwaukee girl or woman will be taken to different states. And oftentimes, not to the big part of the city. They'll be taken to a suburb, suburb somewhere. So if you end up, let's say, in Evanston, Illinois, you're from Milwaukee. That would be a close one, but let's just say Evanston, Illinois, and you're in a suburban hotel, and he's taken your phone. Where do you go? Who do you call? No buses, no ability to move around. You don't know how to get away from that situation. For our victims, oftentimes they might as well be in a whole different country. They don't know. They, they may have never left Milwaukee before. Um, and this is talking a little bit about the circuit. So fraud, force, and coercion. I'm just going to go through these a little quickly because I know time is short, and I want to make sure that all these other wonderful speakers who I really respect get a chance to have, have their full time. Um, I was very impressed that the league included several of us because this is really what I think needs to be done. It's all about partnership. And so uh, having just a prosecutor speak or having a police detective, um, Don, who I have the world of respect for, or Representative uh, Johnson or Martha Love, having only one of us alone here would not give you the a full picture. 
But the fact is we all know each other and we all work together. And if you don't know uh, Dana World Patterson, who's sitting here in the front, she is uh, one of my heroes. She uh, is the head of the task force, uh, the Greater Milwaukee Human Trafficking Task Force, and she keeps us all in line. And uh, <laughs> so if you're interested in seeing how you can get involved, she's the right person to talk to. Well, of course, Martha Love was also on the task force, but I just wanted to make sure that I gave a little shout out to Dana out there. So coercion. Um, this is the type of psychiatric, psychological um, tool. It's not one you're going to see. It makes the person feel threatened in ways that you might not see. Uh, one of the ways is uh, the pimp will tell the girl or woman first that he loves her, or that she's beautiful. Then he'll take her and dine her and take her to bars, etc. Eventually, he'll say to her, well, you know, you're not, you're not carrying your weight. We need some money here. Um, you, you need to go out there and make your money for me. Um, sometimes they use threats, threats to them, threats to their family, threats to use photographs that they've taken that are embarrassing. They withhold their documents like we talked about. They're made to watch others get punished in their front of them. So they don't need to even have a, a touch of their body. Just watching another girl or woman be beaten in front of them is enough coercion. And of course, the verbal, verbal or psychological abuse. I believe that pimps have what I call pimp radar. They know how to find the weakest members of our community, those girls and women that nobody looks for. And I still can't figure out exactly how they do it, but I know that they have it, because when I talk to victims, they almost always tell me a very similar story. They can pick the person that no one will notice. I once heard a pimp say that the way he gets his victims is he goes to the mall, and he looks in the mall to see that group of young girls who walk together. You know how they, they all dress alike, they all kind of look alike. He sees the group. And then he looks to see who's the stragglers at the end. And then he sees who's like the last two girls. And he watches for a while, and if no one in the main group turns back to see where that other girl is, he thinks he might have a potential victim. He'll watch her for a while, and when he feels that no one's looking, which is pretty quickly, he'll go up to her and say something like, nice shoes, or I like your purse. If she answers him, he lets her go. He picks the girl who has no self-esteem, the one who can't even talk. That's his target. So there's also force, and we see this in many of the cases, which are beatings, tortures, kidnappings, confinement, surveillance, restraints, um, denial of food and water. Sometimes a pimp will take a new recruit, a new woman, to his nice house that he has set up for her, Leave her there for a few days with no food. And I'll ask her, well, how did you, what did, did you look in the refrigerator? Yeah, it was empty. Well, what did you do? I didn't eat. Well, what about when you got thirsty? Well, eventually, I went to the tap and got some water until he came back. That's in our cities. There's also removal of children or threats <coughs> against people's children. And um, what we're seeing more and more now is uh, heroin addiction. And this is really what is very scary. Young girls and women who may be either trying heroin or addicted to heroin, pimps will then give them free heroin until they get to a point where they can never support the habit they've developed. It is way too expensive. And so at that point, they then go to them and say, look, you, know, you, can, you can have as much heroin as you want as long as you keep working. And the f not only are they doing it because they want the heroin, but also the fear of being sick and the withdrawal is so horrible that um, they're, not, they're afraid of that. So um, that is a, a type of force. So um, when I, I, I've been a prosecutor for a long, long time, and it used to be that when I worked on cases, I would start off with point A, and knew where I was going to be, and I would you know, right away have that great trajectory of success, hopefully. Human trafficking is a completely different type of crime and a completely type, different kind of conduct. Um, I think the second picture is really more what it looks like. Um, I also think that it's the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. Um, 
every victim somehow ends up on my shoulders. And I, I feel for them, I wish I could help them, and, and a lot of them you can't help, but at least you can, I can try to get those who do this against them um, off the streets, and hopefully you can help educate and train the rest of our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Corrine. I think we've learned a lot already and we're just beginning. Our next speaker is Detective Dawn Jones. Uh, Dawn is born and raised in Milwaukee. She's a graduate of Milwaukee Public Schools. She has an associate degree from MATC and is busy working on trafficking, but soon she's going to have her bachelor's degree. Um, Dawn has been with the Milwaukee Police Department for 21 years. She's been part of the Human Trafficking Task Force for the past seven years. Uh, Dawn's goal is to, or task is to promote the combined efforts between citizens, victim services, and law enforcement to assist in the prosecution of traffickers, as well as assisting victims of trafficking to become who they were made to become. Detective, thank you. Thank you. You're not clapping, you, you don't even know what I'm gonna say yet. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna take the attorney's lead and put a disclaimer out that I too give a lot of opinions that may not be that of the Milwaukee Police Department, so. And I'm not a politician, so I could get in trouble for probably some of them. I also wanna say, um, I know this is being videotaped, as we watched later, I requested that I not be shown. Now, I, I have been investigating this, and it's not a great task that I'm investigating trafficking. I didn't have a strive for it. I didn't say, oh, this is really what I want to do. Uh, when I started out, they said, Dawn, you want to go vice control days? And I said, absolutely, I'll go vice control days, because you got to wear jeans, you got to look cool, you can do whatever you want. Who doesn't want to do that, right? Um, which is um, where I spent eight of my years on uh, early shift, is investigating narcotics and, and working vice. And they said, well, you have to do this human trafficking stuff. And I'm like, well, what is that? They're like, we're not really sure. And I'm thinking, we've had a grant for uh, a couple of years, and, and my bosses aren't sure. How can I be sure what I'm going to do? But I'm a very active officer, so I say, okay, let, let me do this. Let me um, try it out. They said, there's a desk. And on this desk, there's this box, and it's full of all this stuff from the prior detectives that have investigated human trafficking. I'm like, oh, okay. So I go over there, and, and I am an MPS grad. So I take the smallest pamphlet with the most pictures, colorful pictures, I like color. <laughs> and I, I open it up, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, oh, I don't get this. Then I flipped it right side up. <laughs> and, I, and I thought to myself, I totally get this. Not only have I seen this my entire career, but I have seen this my entire life. I grew up by was, um, Washington Park. I went to MPS. I took the, the 30 bus over to Wisconsin Avenue and took the 27 up every morning at 5 a.m. I was in sports. I took it home. I didn't get home till 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. I seen what was out there. I knew what was out there. I had friends that I'm sure were involved in it that I had not known my entire life, didn't know what it was. We kind of look like um, goofs to these traffickers who have been doing this for so many years. I know people believe that uh, uh, prostitution is the oldest crime on the books. Trafficking is the oldest crime on the books. My opinion, trafficking. It wasn't a woman that went out one day and said, you know what, I can make money doing this. It was some guy that, or some, maybe it could be a female pimp. We have female pimps and male pimps. I said that, you know what, I can make money off this person. And all I have to do is make them do this. Now, Crean did an unbelievable job in explaining what trafficking was. And I'd like to try and give a little bit of the, the victim side of it from what we've seen in Milwaukee. We're known as a source city nationwide. We get calls from Iowa, from Indiana, from Atlanta, from Houston, from Miami, from Washington, D.C., from the Dakotas, all over the country because our traffickers are taking our girls 
and they're taking them nationwide. And you kind of kind of put yourself in the, the victim's uh, mind a little bit because, um, like Corrine said, it's like they look like they're free to roam. Well, that's a disguise. And I had this experience because I went down to, to, to Mexico and I did some training, um, thanks to Corrine. And uh, when I went down there, my ride back was uh, um, kind of a little freaky for me because I'm in a country, I don't speak their language. My plane got um, uh, canceled. I couldn't get back to the States. I had nobody that was speaking English or translating for me and I'm trying to whittle my way through this and all I keep hearing is I can't make it back, I can't make it back. And so finally I ended up buying a, a really expensive Starbucks so I could get the code for internet, you know? And now I'm, I'm Skyping people, I'm like, hey, I need to do this, I need to do that. It took me 16 hours to get back. And here, I'm law enforcement, I have um, a lot of people that are willing to uh, help me out and hear me on my side. And how frustrating was that for me and how alone did I feel? I can't imagine if somebody were beating me every day, sexually assaulting me every day, if they were the only person that I could trust said, hey, you cannot leave this Starbucks or you're going to be killed or you're going to be beaten. And that's what we have with our victims in trafficking. And a lot of people uh, place judgment on them because they are tough and they have a hard time. I'm telling you, when I go to trial with victims from trafficking and I talk to them and they say, you know what, I don't want to cry. Why don't you want to cry? Because he meaning the trafficker, said it was a sign of weakness. And, I, and I, I usually swear, but I won't today. But I said, well, you know, that's, that's not right, right? You know why he says that? They're like, no. To dehumanize you, to make you a robot. If you cry, you have heart, you have your soul. The minute you learn to live without crying and without feeling, you are a robot and he can control you. And in one of my cases, I had all four victims, and it was funny, because I didn't ask them. They volunteered that information to me as I'm talking to them. Hey, how's it going? How you feeling? Um, you know what, just get up there, tell the truth. That's all you gotta do. I know this is gonna be difficult for you. Yeah, but I don't wanna cry. Every single victim, four victims in a row, said the exact same thing. And afterwards, they each came out. And I'm like, how, how are you doing? How did it go? I cried. <laughs> and I'm like crying with them. I'm like, it's okay. You got yourself back, you got your soul back, you got your heart back. But they put on this persona like they're strong and they don't know who to trust. So a lot of times they may come off as, as being um, somebody that we don't necessarily want to help or take care of. When in their eyes they're telling you, please help me, I need somebody to help me. And I've been fortunate enough at doing this for seven years that I've seen young ladies at 15 years of age being um, put into trafficking, become amazing young women and become nurses and CNAs and physical therapists. And it's really kind of funny how much they really want to get into the healthcare. I had one 14 year old girl, I said, what is it you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a nurse. Why do you want to be a nurse? Because when I was handcuffed and I was arrested, my nose was running and she's the only one that took a tissue and wiped my nose and said, there, are you okay now? She's the only one that showed that she cared. And we in society don't get that. A lot of us are very, very fortunate and very, very blessed in what we have. That we don't get and get to see the pain that these victims have and these victims endure. And I'm telling you, these are anybody's kids. And, and people don't believe me. I've had officers, family members involved in this. I've had nurses, family members involved in this. I've had BMCW family members involved in this. It is anybody's child. They are not throwaway people. As a ma matter of fact, I am so blessed to have met um, so many victims of trafficking. They are the most amazing people you can ever imagine. And to realize that some uh, perpetrator was able to beat them down to where they felt like they were nothing. And this is our future. I mean, and I, I know uh, uh, most of people will probably say, yeah, who wouldn't? But I would have some of these young ladies as a squad partner over most of the Milwaukee Police Department officers that are out there. Because they are so attentive to detail. 
they are so um, in touch with what's going on around them, with what's, what's right and what's wrong, and they know what's right and what's wrong. They just can't always believe in themselves to take what it is that they want and what they can have. Now, a lot of these kids are not addicted to drugs. A lot of people think they are. As a matter of fact, most traffickers do not let them use drugs. Don't let them use alcohol. One, it costs the trafficker money, and two, they're harder to control. And I don't know if anybody out here has ever been drunk before. I'm guessing not, because we're all really good citizens. But <laughs> I'm guessing if one or two of you were, you would probably realize, yeah, I probably wasn't in my right mind last night. And, and people are like, come this way, and you're wandering over that way. It happens, right? So the trafficker's not making any money if you're not listening to the rules. And unfortunately, when you talk about trafficking, when you, when you talk about um, these victims being out there in different locations, they have like their own little gang, like their own little group. They have their own little law. It's called pimp law. And in pimp law, these traffickers look out for each other. When they respect each other, and if you respect pimp law, your traffickers will respect you, and they will watch out for you. If you have a girl that is testifying against you, they will try and find that girl and make sure she doesn't show up for court. If you have um, a stable of girls, which is a group of young ladies that are out there being trafficked, they will run that stable for you so you can pay your defense attorney. It's amazing how many traffickers have very high paid defense attorneys. Does anybody wonder where that money comes from? Because a well-established trafficker can make $500,000 on one girl in one year. This is organized crime that we've turned a blind eye to. Most traffickers were drug dealers, but because they got so much time dealing drugs, they decided to go to trafficking people. And in my opinion, the, the um, amount of time that they're getting for trafficking is not, not enough. We're getting 20-year plea bargains, and in my opinion, that is not enough. Because when we talk about trafficking, we talk about one instance of trafficking. We may charge one instance of trafficking, when in reality, we could probably charge 100 counts of trafficking and probably 300 counts of sexual assault. But, but we don't. We, we um, keep it down to something that's more uh, handle, handleable in court. And, um, but when sentencing comes, it should be a slam dunk. Everybody's happy about the 56-year sentence. My opinion, and I know I've, I've got a lot of opinions, my opinion is he should never have the ability to see the light of day. He's got 31 years in. He should be in there for the rest of his life because he trafficked a child, and he sexually assaulted that child for years and had that child out there doing prostitution dates for years. Nobody should be allowed out after doing that, my opinion. So um, what we need to do is we, need, as a community, need to work together. And I was talking earlier how I would love to get the term prostitute taken out of it, all statutes. It is such a derogatory term, and we've had, in history, a lot of derogatory terms that are, are in our laws that have been removed. And this is one of them. Because there's such a stigma on the term prostitute that immediately everybody thinks it's a willing act and, and thinks very lowly of that person. Even in the trafficking community, the traffickers will not refer to them as prostitutes unless they're trying to degrade them. They're considered hoes, which are up here, and prostitutes and whores are down here. So they might say, you're not a prostitute, you're a hoe, you work for me, we got game, we've got a family going on, let's get this thing going, you're way up here. And if they do something the trafficker doesn't like, you ain't nothing but a whore, you ain't nothing but a prostitute. And so what do we do? We use that terminology in court. And how, how does that make the victim feel, right? In my last case, the defense attorney kept calling our, our victim a prostitute. I re didn't call her a prostitute, and, we kind of had a little debate in the court hearing. But the minute she took the stand, he's like, are you a prostitute? She's like, yes. Well, yeah, because she's been told that for the last four years. That's what she is. That's what society believes her to be. And if we in society can change how these victims view themselves and how the community views them, they're going to have a much better chance of becoming who they were made to become. 
And so I'm going to end it on that because I'm getting this little circle over here that I talk too much. Um, <laughs> but thank you very much. And I, whatever you guys can do to assist and whatever I can do to assist you, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Don. Our next speaker is Martha Love. Martha and I just follow each other around the city. <laughs> We're both uh, part of the African American Roundtable. We've spent hours sitting together down at City Hall watching uh, elections, being poll monitors, uh, a few other a few other good things. Martha loves Milwaukee. She's married, has three children. She has been a longtime community advocate and ac activist for over 30 years. Uh, she's a political organizer at the national as well as the local level. And she, Martha serves on the board of African World Festival, the Women's Fund, the National Democratic Committee, and my brain just quit, the Task Force on Human Trafficking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Martha Love. Good morning. Good morning. The first thing I would like to say is we need your help. Just so you understand, we need your help. I am here to ask for your help to stop the rape of our three year olds six months documented, seven years old, 14 and 17. We need your help. I got started because we had several young people, 10 through 13, that were volunteers for African World Festival. And we watched their growth. They would come volunteer and you know what you know, if you go to the festival, you know there's a lot of different duties. And we were also teaching them how to be board members in the future. So after a while, we noticed these young women were looking very gothic. Dark circles around their eyes. Their dress was just so bizarre. And they were really unmanageable in their homes because, as Dawn said, their trafficker had told them, your goal is to leave home, get into the foster care system so that you can get away when I need you to get away. Now, these young girls lived in the Mequon area. They came from four and five bedroom homes, traveled with their parents. Both parents were business persons. So these young people had all of the bells and whistles as it relates to cell phone, um, computer, they had everything the traffickers needed to be in contact with them and to pull them out of school when they needed them to come and satisfy one of the Johns to perform a sex act. So all of this occurred. One of the young, gifted and talented young girls determined, I've had enough of this. I've had enough of this harassment. She then went on Facebook, showed some of the classes that they were having at one of the homes. And one of the classes that was being held in this 4,000 feet spacious home in the Mequon area, he was teaching her about pornography, how to use uh, different toys, and how to manipulate a penis, sorry about the language, and how to satisfy a John so that they can make money. Plus, all of these eight girls was having sex with two boys that went to very prominent schools in our area. After all of this was discovered, that's when their parents told me the story. I haven't stopped crying yet, and it's been six years. My determination as a professional organizer, I organize presidential campaigns, U.S. Senate governors, mayors, uh, across the board. If I cannot warn our community 
that we need your help to save our children. These are not just urban girls and boys. These are our children throughout the city and the suburbs of this state. Dana and I were in, Walkish, in um, Wausau, Sheboygan. We're all over this state saying to people, we need your help to save our children. Dawn does an outstanding job. She's been like one and now a couple for several years to try and get the message out. So that's what our responsibility is as the Human Trafficking Task Force. Marina, for years, she's been out there by herself, but no community component to a sister. That's what the task force does. We bring awareness to this issue that our children in this community are not given a fair chance. Can you imagine how we used to allow our children to go to the mall at Bayshore? Prime location. And let them have their experience with their friends, do a little shopping, go to the show, and just kind of hang out. You cannot allow that. You have to clock them every hour for their own safety. And you have to explain to them in great detail why it's important that I know where you are and who your friends are. Who's their mama? Who's their daddy? Who's their auntie? Where do they live? Show me something. So anyway, 56 years <laughs> for this Weatherall pimp that was just put in jail. Thank you, Jesus. Just put in jail. He should have gotten 800 years. Dana and I, Dana World Patterson is going to come up. Come on up, because I'm going to be done in two seconds. Dana World Patterson is our chair. And Dana invited me down to the courthouse to this particular hearing. And it was unbelievable what I seen. Not at this hearing, but a lot of things that we hear about what the traffickers do to control these men and women and these transgenders and people that come from the LGBT community. How they pull their teeth if they don't cooperate. How they beat them unmercifully. Treat them like non-humans. That is what I hate. I hate it for someone to control a situation where people feel hopeless. And there's nothing worse than hopelessness when you look around and you see everybody is doing well and you feel hopeless. So, we, our task force got together, it was authorized by Milwaukee County. We are affiliated with the city of Milwaukee and the Domestic Violence uh, Commission of, of Sexual Assault. And, um, I'm sorry, say that again, because I got it off. Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence? Yes, I'm one of the commissioners, she's an alternate. And our main goal is to inform the community and to ask for your help to save our six-month-old children and our three-year-old children and our seven-year-old children and our 14-year-old children and our 17-year-olds. And if you have a child that just all of a sudden seems just totally out of control, look at the babysitter. Check out the babysitters. You know, go into grandmama mold. Do not allow your children to allow my good friend without checking them out to be involved with your children. And those nasty uncles and those, you know, uncles, sit on my lap, baby. No, no, don't let them sit on your lap. So anyway, we got some real critters out here, but we need your help so that we can again realize a safe community. I would like to introduce to you one of the greatest women I know, and that is Dana World Patterson. Dana and her husband and her family have helped us to take on this journey 
to save our children. And another person that's on this panel is Latanya Johnson. She's one of our great legislators who cares about what happens to the children in the city of Milwaukee and the state of Wisconsin. Thank you for your attention. Here's Dana World Patterson. It's, it's so important. I'm, I shake in the inside every time I have the opportunity to hear the devastation of what's going on in our communities, what's happening to our women and girls, and the plight that is hidden in plain sight. And as I was driving over here, I had another, I saw it again. And I saw it in a way there was this man on the corner and on the island and he had a sign. And I didn't look up to read the sign because he's always there. And I said, this is how it has been perpetrated. We see it, but we don't wanna see it. And the Human Trafficking Task Force and many of us have come together and we're working night and day I don't sleep much because I'm thinking about it. Looking at ways and how we're rolling up our sleeves to eradicate human trafficking in our neighborhood and in our neighborhoods. It has been documented that human trafficking is in all 72 counties. And it is important for me to say that it's not an inner city black girl thing. We have to pay attention. It, um, there was a survivor that shared the story that at 14, when she was taken away to Chicago, that she was the only African American. She said when she made it to the hotel room, there were Asians, Caucasians. She said there were even Indians in the room. He had three rooms. All of them were in the middle and there were he had two working rooms on the other side. So we have to look at it that this is our problem. Awesome. Come, come back, come back, come back. Can we put her on this side as well? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. This summer, this past summer, there was a sweep cross, it's called? Operation Cross Country. Operation Cross Country. And we don't know where it is exactly, but there were six youth that were rescued and 12 pimps that were charged. So that's good news. We know that there is a problem in Wisconsin. That's really good news that six youth, I want you all to clap right there, that there, are six, that there were six youth that were rescued and 12 pimps that were charged. That, that's phenomenal. These numbers, and we know that they're low. The numbers that we use on a regular basis is that there are like 200 to 300,000 uh, children within the United States borders. If they're 80% women, they're 50% children. It's devastating. And that's the wind beneath our wings and why we get up every day. And I love the collaboration that's taking place. It's been six years. Six years. The Human Trafficking Task Force, we're the community response to eradicating human trafficking. And we do it through coordinated services, uh, education, and policy and legislation. We have 40 to 50 people that come to our meetings from all across the sector. And you're invited to come as well. We just want you to come and be willing to roll up your sleeves. Oh, I see what you're saying, sir. All right. I thought that was just for my view. Okay. You can, you can take it down. Yes, please. Thank you. This summer, we had the opportunity to collaborate with Serve Marketing and we came up with unlucky 13, 13 being the average age that girls in particular are trafficked, 13. And we know that it's 12, 11, 10, as Martha had stated, even younger and up. I'd just like to share this, this quick story. 
this story about Maria. She entered the life at 13, but she said that it was the perfect storm when she was coerced, thinking the smooth talker could offer her more than her addicted mom. She wanted to be normal and fill her voids. He didn't mention he would crack her skull with a hot iron, knock out her teeth, stump her stomach, and force an abortion, not to mention the contagious diseases. He wanted money, and she wanted a better life. And these stories are endless. So Unlucky 13 is very important to, and I'm going to share with you, going up, I'll go the other way, pardon me. Let me help you. I, and, I see it now. Okay, go down. Yep. There you go. We find that it's hard to believe in Milwaukee, 13 being the average number. 13, behind the 13, we had this mob. 13 was appearing all over the city. Why? It's unluckier than you think. We were raising awareness, and we really do appreciate you all sharing that it, your, the Unlucky 13 campaign on your flyer. So it was in June that we staged a press rally, and in front of central, the Central Library, it was just hundreds of people with these signs holding the 13, stating that the average age girl was um, wanted for the 13 was the average age. So we saw this all over. We had the press conference, the collaboration, the human trafficking task force, the county, the city, uh, the health department. 60 bus shelters were superimposed with this 13. MPD was there, Clear Channel. Clear Channel gave us 60 bus shelters, plus, and that's the bus shelter. So you may have seen that. And when you come up a little closer, again, it says it's unluckier than you think. And we want to drive people to the website, being unlucky13.org. On the website, there's information about warning signs and tips for parents, tips for teenagers. During the summer, many teenagers are left alone. And if there's a trafficker watching, they are vulnerable. The good thing about what has happened, many good things have happened. But when we started this campaign, we had about 61 likes on Facebook. Serve marketing their phenomenal. By July 25th, we had over 2,400 likes with an increase of over 2,000% in one month. So please, you're still welcome to go to the page, like us, go there from time to time so that you can get more information. Also, that day in June, we asked the task force and we asked our friends to change their profile pic on Facebook to the Unlucky 13. So there was just this mass awareness that 13 is unluckier than you think. Also, that day, that was the sweep. So we had the information about the sweep going on, and that was the day we had our press conference. So it was just a glorious day in the press. Did anyone see that? Oh, good. You all are. Over six million, six million touches throughout this this um, campaign awareness. And next, we're, you'll be seeing these vending machine ads, again, saying that our children are not for sale. Thank you so much. I would love for you to get involved. She said, would I like to say anything else? I would love for you to get involved. We, we need more people that will roll up their sleeves, that will talk about it around the dinner table, that will beat the drum of consistency that this is happening within our community, but we are not going to just sit back and act as if we don't see it. 
We, we're going to raise our voices, do what we can, tell our friends, those that have authority, those that have influence, so that we can move legislation, so that we can put some money uh, you know, towards this effort. Whatever it is that you can do to make a difference, please join us. Thank you again. Okay, uh, our next speaker is Latanya Johnson. State Representative Johnson, she represents the 17th District, which is on Milwaukee's northwest side. It's, uh, she's beginning her second term. Uh, that seat is the seat that our own Barbara Tolles held. Barbara is a league member and a former league president before she ran for the assembly, so that location's dear to us. Uh, Latanya is chair of the Milwaukee delegation right now. She is co-chair of the rehoming committee, which I had no clue. It sounded like carrier pigeons to me. <laughs> but uh, I can tell you briefly, it, it's a, a committee that looks at international adoptions. I know we've read in the paper about some international adoptions go sour. I mm -hmm. guess that might be the best way. And people put ads on Craigslist to have somebody else take their children. Um, so Latanya is looking at international adoptions. She co-authored a bill with Joel Clayfish, a little bipartisan cooperation there, uh, ab about those uh, rehoming, about those adoptions. And that legislation is a model for other states. and. Uh, we're looking at laws for re-adoption. Latanya's the mother of a 17-year-old daughter who's heading off to college next year. She's a former daycare provider. And um, she's been working on different legislation in last session, which I think is really good for a new, new assembly person. She authored Assembly Bill 192, which required victims of human trafficking receive services from the child welfare agencies rather than just being treated by the criminal justice uh, division as criminals. So, Latanya, thank you. Thank you for inviting me out today. It's so important that as much as possible, we get the word out about human trafficking. When I was first running for um, the seat that I hold now was the first time that I had ever heard about human trafficking. And I remember Martha gave me a terms and meaning sheet. And this sheet intrigued me so much because I had heard terms around the city but didn't know exactly what they meant or where the meanings came from. Um, I never knew that they were human trafficking terms, like the term daddy. Um, what most pimps are called by their prostitutes. Or there's a term on here called, um, I believe it's called pimp party. And a pimp party means this is when several pimps unite to abuse prostitutes, either for being disrespectful, trying to leave the game, or, rep or reporting a pimp to the police. The pimp party usually consists of several pimps gang raping the prostitute, beating her, urinating, and defecating on her, and other forms of abuses. The pimp stick. Item used by a pimp to beat his prostitute. The item can be any type of weapon. Some pimps prefer to use a coat hanger. It was this terminology sheet that started it all for me. I brought this sheet home and I just laid it on my dining room table. At the time I had an in-home daycare center. And my teacher walked past the dining room table and she picked it up and she said, Tanya, what is this? I said, oh, it's a terminology sheet for human trafficking. I said, but I don't really know how serious that is in Milwaukee. She started reading the sheets. But in the process of her reading this, she started talking about people that both her and I grew up with who had been victims of human trafficking. 
Some I knew had hard lives, but why that was, I, I didn't really understand. And at the time, the beautician that did my hair, I didn't know she was a human trafficking victim. Her mom, when she was younger, had a, a serious drug addiction. So her mom used to sell her for drugs. Now, when we think about parents, we don't think that there's a parent out there that would contribute to this type of lifestyle. But for so many of our children, especially those living here in Milwaukee and in other parts of the state, that's exactly where they got their first introduction into the human trafficking trades. And when she was talking about the experiences of our friends that were around our age at the time, which was, we'll just say, closer to 40, <laughs> her 15-year-old daughter came out the kitchen, and she started talking about her friends at her school that were human trafficking victims and what they told her and, and how these kids are getting involved. So that let me know that not only was this something that had happened in the past, but it continues to happen, and it's intergenerational. As I started to do more research, Martha started inviting me to more forums. And even now, this panel that I'm on today, I'm still learning. A lot of, it, there's so much information concerning human trafficking, so many avenues involving human trafficking that it's impossible for one person to know everything. So even sitting on this panel, I'm still learning. And when I decided that this was something that I could get involved with, this was something that I could do, I, I took up the calls full force. I went to the Capitol, and some of the first legislation that I introduced was surrounding human trafficking. In this state, um, the first bill I, I, I drafted was known as the Caregiver Law, or Assembly Bill 192. Basically, in this state, if a child is known to be involved in sex trafficking or human trafficking or commercial sex acts, if the perpetrator is not a parent, a guardian, a caregiver, then the Department of Children and Families, they don't have to get involved legally to help assist with the investigation for this child's crime. Now that holds a double-edged sword because for a lot of these girls, the one resource that they're lacking is a safe place to go. If these children have been abused at home, and then they get involved in a human trafficking lifestyle, and they're rescued, and the only place that we have to send them is home, what's going to happen? They're going to run away, right? They're going to run away. So one of the duties for the Department of Children and Families is to find these children resources, to find them a safe place to live, counseling services to make sure that they're able to get out of this lifestyle, resources, health screening, medical assistance. As long as the Department of Children and Families don't have that legal responsibility, a lot of that falls to the court system. So right here in the city of Milwaukee, you have judges who are sentencing some of these victims to incarceration which if they're under the age of 17, that's the juvenile system, but if they're over the age of 17, that's adult prison. Because in the state of Wisconsin, if you're 17, that's an adult charge. And they're not sentencing these young individuals to prison or to the juvenile detention system because they're not aware that these children are, or these individuals are victims. They know that they're victims. They're doing it because they have nowhere else for these individuals to go. And in a lot of cases, in some cases, not all, incarceration is for the individual's own protection because they don't have any place else to send them. And when you look at Wisconsin being a, a feeder state, that shouldn't happen. We never want to sentence an individual to jail for their own safety. We want to be able to give them a safe place to go and services, 
But we never want to rely on incarceration as being our only alternative. And that's where we have to do better in terms of legislation. In the city of Milwaukee, um, if a police officer picks up a human trafficking victim, the Bureau of Milwaukee Child Welfare has dedicated two social workers to specifically work with human trafficking victims. But that's only here in the city of Milwaukee. And the call has to clearly be identified as human trafficking. But what happens to the rest of the state? From that hotline just by itself, I'm told that they get between two and three phone calls um, a month for human trafficking victims. So at the high end, you're looking at 36 victims just from the city of Milwaukee a year. The low end, 24. But the problem for the state of Wisconsin is we don't have any concrete numbers because there hasn't been any research specifically dealing with human trafficking victims. Now, there was a report that came out last session regarding the Homicide Review Commission where um, um, I think it's Detective Mallory looked at cases over the last two years and came up with 77 victims, but that wasn't concrete. That was just information that she was able to pull from various files that said these young women had um, some interaction with human trafficking. The other thing, too, is training for our police departments. Our police departments are getting the training that they need, and I would say in Milwaukee, we're light years ahead of some of the other counties. But some of these young women who are being encountered are being given tickets for loitering. They're given, being given tickets for every other thing or just being told to go home, but they're not being recognized as human trafficking victims. So that's the first thing that we need to do is to make sure that law enforcement all over this state has the training to recognize these crimes. The other thing that we need to do, we need to fight for funding to make sure that the resources that I talked about are available. I'm proud to say that Governor Walker proposed $2 million in his budget to deal with human trafficking for child victims, and that's huge. Because the Department of Children and Families has never, in its, in its inception, requested one dime to deal with human trafficking victims. The bill that I, I talked about, the Assembly Bill 192, also known as the Caregiver Bill, when it was introduced, it passed the Asse Assembly Committee unanimously. It went to a Senate hearing and we invited individuals to come up and, and testify about this bill and the importance of the bill and how it would impact human trafficking victims in the state of Wisconsin. And we had overwhelming support. The only problem was the $24 million price tag that the Department of Children and Families said that this bill would hold for the state. We were told in a private door conversation to go sit around a table and hash this, this cost issue out because it was an excellent bill. People wanted to see it passed on both, on both sides. It had bipartisan support. We wanted to make sure that the child victims in this state had the resources that that was needed. Now, there's no misunderstanding that human trafficking affects more than just children. It affects adult victims too. But the reason that we went after the child victims is because children garner more sympathy. People can understand children being forced into prostitution or into sex slavery. What this society as a whole has not found compassion for are adult survivors. Even though we know the vast majority of these individuals went into this game as a child and never got the help or the resources that they needed. A couple of our offices sat down with the Department of Children and Families and we talked about the importance of making sure that this bill got passed and, and making sure that we were able to help these children. And we were told that these children were not a priority. And I am not 
by any means, not stating it the way we were told, that these children were not a priority. And they were not a priority because there were too many other things that we were dropping the ball on concerning our children. Children were aging out of the foster care system and having nowhere to go, that was a priority. Making sure that there was enough funding available for the massive influx of children who were entering the child welfare system, that was a priority. And there was a list of other priorities, but these children were not a priority because they come with a whole slew of complications. They come with, some of them come with PTSD symptoms because they have been in captivity for so long. When you talk about teenage victims, you're also talking about teenage pregnancies. So that makes it harder for them to find homes for these victims. Um, we were told that they were having a hard enough time finding good foster homes for the children that they have. So when you complicate that with such a complicated population, they weren't willing to risk those foster homes and they couldn't combine the two. When you look at this type of issue and you look at it from a public safety perspective, some of these individuals have sexually transmitted diseases that need to be taken care of. Let's just be honest. That also comes at a dollar amount but it comes at a higher dollar amount for the public because we know that these individuals aren't being sent to clinics for treatment because it's, it's too risky for these pimps to be caught. So these young ladies are having to deal with these issues themselves. We know that a lot of these individuals aren't being looked for. And Wisconsin, the Department of Children and Families, they don't deal with runaways. They do not deal with runaways. On any given night in this city, we have four, at least 450 children who are homeless and sleeping on the streets. So when you wanna talk about a selection of individuals, we have it. So having that money being proposed in the budget is huge. It's huge for the state. Because currently, right now, the Department of Children and Families has created a partnership with an organization called Lad Lake. And Lad Lake has currently signed a contract to house um, some of Wisconsin's human trafficking victims. But they only have five beds. And that's five beds to service the entire state. And according to the Department of Children and Families, to treat one of these individuals correctly, that's with the medical care they need, the counseling services they need, to provide the shelter that they need, it costs this state $10,000 a month per individual. $10,000 a month. So when you look at this crime, not only do we have an incentive to incarcerate these perpetrators because the only person who's not paying for this crime the way that they should are the perpetrators. The state is paying for the medical care when these victims are rescued. We're paying for the prosecution services. We're paying for all the resources. The pimps are making between two hundred to $500,000 per individual and the vast majority of the um, stables that they have consist of children. Some of these pimps have been caught with Bentleys. I've never seen a Bentley, never taught a Bentley. Wouldn't recognize one if one drove past me. But these individuals are driving Bentleys. They're buying jewelry, I think, um, Tyrone McMillan had a necklace that was valued over $92,000. That cost more than my house. These individuals are collecting the resources off of these young children. And the price that they're paying when they are caught isn't high enough. When you talk about trying to create funds um, to help deal with the human trafficking problem, we proposed Assembly Bill 811, which would add a $500 surcharge for individuals convicted of crimes against children, human trafficking, pandering, 
or solicitation of prostitution. And we wanted the funds to go to the Children's Trust Fund for war grants of prevention of, of child sexual exploitation. And one of the reasons that we created the surcharge is because when the state confiscates the assets, all the assets that they are able to keep, those assets are automatically then put into the school funds to help fund our, our public schools. And there is no deviation from that fund. So in order to garner the money that we necessarily need to be able to combat this fight, we have to find other creative ways of getting it. But the thing that I want you guys to remember, if you don't remember anything else that any of us said today, is that we need your help in order to get the services that these individuals need to become happy, healthy, just whole individuals. The one thing that I remember from talking to some of our victims, and I've heard a lot of stories, but the one commonality that they share is that every last one of these individuals, when they get out of this lifestyle, they reach back and they help other individuals to get out of this lifestyle. And that's very important because for someone who has been made to feel so low for so long, for the vast majority of their lives, the first thing that they want to do when they get out is to reach back and help other people. I know for an individual like me, I can't imagine living one day in a lifestyle like that. But these women survive years. And I don't want to just be exclusive to women because we do have male victims too. But these individuals survive for years. And the one mode of survival that they pretty much all have is the fact that they make it through mentally believing that someone out there is looking for them. But the reality is, is that they're only freed, in most cases, when they free themselves. And so it's your responsibility, as well as mine, to hold all of our elected officials accountable, to make sure that we do what's right for these victims. Because with Wisconsin growing as a feeder state, they don't just have to prey on vulnerable populations anymore. They can prey on my child. They can prey on your grandchild. They can prey on your next door neighbor until we unite to do something about this awful, horrible crime. So thank you. This has been an MCM Productions program.